So uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to talk about reconstructing uh, derivational morphology. Um, so yesterday we've we've had a number of uh, talks about phonological reconstruction, and then in the end um, it was sort of pointed out that we we also need to have methods for morphological reconstruction and we maybe don't feel quite as confident about morphological reconstruction as we feel about phonological reconstruction. Uh, so this talk sort of goes in that direction and, and tries to figure out what kind of methods or what kind of uh, uh, yeah, methodology we need or we should use to do uh, derivational morphology uh, and reconstruction. Um, so when we do reconstruct uh, derivational morphology, there are some problems that we're immediately confronted with that we need to worry about. Uh, we need to think about the properties of verbal derivational morphemes that we want to reconstruct, or we need to worry about which ones we can reconstruct, which ones we should reconstruct, uh, and those may differ from the ones that are regularly reconstructed. Um, so we need to decide which properties of the historical, historically attested derivational morphology that we see uh, belong to the reconstructed proto-language uh, and which properties are independent innovations. Uh, and then we need to decide on how to formalize the properties of these morphemes and I think that's where, where there's the most insecurity because um, we're not always sure whether we want to do that and how we want to do that. And I think that's actually an important uh, step that we need to take um, in order to help us generalize and also compare diachronic developments uh, within and across languages. Um, so this is going to help us to, uh, to uh, explain how morphosyntactic properties of derivational morphology uh, changes. Um, okay. So to give you a concrete example from uh, Indo-European, so this is from the lexicon of Indo-European verbs, uh, the LID. Um, and this is the entry for uh, proto indo european Gwen to hit. Um, and now we are confronted with uh, a frequent puzzle that we have when we use the LID, uh, namely how many, how many primary verbal stems do we reconstruct for this root. So here the LAV editors in this blue box tell us that Proto Indo European had three primary or inherited verbal stems. Uh, the oldest one is an old asymmetric present that we have attested in Pitkite and uh, Indo Iranian. So this is actually attested in some languages. And then we have a reduplicated present and a scale present. And this is attested in Vedic and Tukarian, respectively. Um, and then in this orange box, we have um, a number of verbs in different languages, so meaning Greek, Latin, Old Irish, and so on, with these square uh, brackets here. And this is how the editors tell us that these are innovations. So the, the stem forming morphology in these verbs is not directly inherited, it's not the same as these verbs, it's an innovation. Um, so and this, this actually raises a number of questions. So why do we have three primary present stems? And usually people say, oh, they had different functions originally, uh, or maybe there are different diachronic layers. Um, and then the reflexes of some of the stems vary, as we've seen, right? So we have, uh, as reflex of this oldest stem, we actually have thematic stems or yeo presence in, uh, in the Indo-European languages. Um, so, so the question here is, how do we decide whether any stem, a, a given stem that we see in the Indo-European daughter languages is inherited or a branch-specific innovation, right? So what makes the editors of LID decide that this thing is an innovation, but these two that are also only attested in one branch are inherited, right? So, um, so this is a common problem and of course LIV is uh, a great resource and the editors usually do tell us why they decided one way or the other in their footnotes and so on. Uh, but this is just a problem that you have for basically every entry in LIV. This is uh, a very common problem. 
So the question is, is this just a problem that weird Indo-Europeanists have? Um, but I think this is a much more common problem um, that you have immediately when you go, when you, when you reconstruct derivational morphology in any uh, family, right? So I, just to illustrate this, I tried to find examples from other families um, in old Chinese, um, Baxter and Sagar talk about all these reconstructed verbal morphemes and then they say uh, about this end prefix, uh, this typically derive state of intransitive verbs often from transitive, uh, from transitive verbs. And then one of the examples they give to me looks like a straightforward, causa straightforward causative alternation uh, where you have uh, a transitive causative and then you derive the intransitive anti-causative, right, to so detransitivize and that's all nice and well, and then they talk about the S prefix, and they say this increases valency in a verb, um, and then one of their examples also looks like a causative alternation verb, but in this case, uh, the anti-causative variant is basic, and the causative variant is the derived one. So, so there are two ways of treating causative alternation verbs, and now we could ask which ones are, or maybe there are more ways, so I just pick this uh, example. So now we could ask which ones are primary causatives, which ones are primary anti-causatives, how can we tell, and which type of verbs can be selected by these prefixes, and can they be combined, and so on. Um, so, so I think this is a more general problem, um, or, or another uh, very frequent problem is um, a situation that we see here in Proto-Algonquian, uh, in the verbal system, we have this formative morpheme that's lost with question marks here in the independent inflection, um, where it's not quite clear what it's doing there. It seems to be some sort of verbal stem forming suffix, maybe. Um, but Proto Algonquian also had a nominalizer that looked very similar and that you could use to form uh, abstract nouns from, from verbal roots or stems. Um, and these are both reconstructed for Proto-Algonquian. Uh, so it looks like some sort of reanalysis re happened and a nominalizer became part of the verbal stem uh, uh, forming suffixes. Um, so this is also something that we see happening very often and the question is how did this happen? Why did, it ha did this happen? Uh, and how did the properties of this thing change from forming nouns to forming verbs? Uh, so these are the general questions that uh, that we that we're going to be confronted with when we do a reconstruction of verbal derivational morphology. Okay, so the goal today is to uh, discuss some theoretical background and methods that I think might be useful in reconstructing derivational morphology, uh, especially um, with respect to understanding the diachrony of derivational morphemes in the verbal system. And we're going to look at three case studies from uh, Indo-European. Uh, hopefully we get to look at all three. Um, and then conclude and uh, try to point out some generalizations that follow from this. Okay, um, so for the background, I try to keep this very short, but I think there are some concepts that are useful um, and that I can take for granted. Um, some of them are framework specific. Uh, the uniformitarian principle we all know and love, uh, the Borak-Chomsky conjecture, a non-lexicalist approach to derivational morphology, and then what exactly we mean by selection and what exactly <coughs> we mean by reanalysis. And some of these are probably familiar to you, but um, just to make sure. Um, so the uniformitarian principle um, you probably all know and use in some version that's similar to this quote by Hock here. So the general processes and principles, which can be noticed in observable history, uh, are applicable in all stages of language history. And uh, I think we all subscribe to that because otherwise there wouldn't be much point in doing reconstruction. Um, what uh, another way of formulating this in, uh, in generative uh, approaches uh, to linguistic theory is that uh, this uniform behavior of human language follows from the fact that uh, there is an innate human capacity for language 
or for acquiring a language that's also called universal grammar sometimes. Uh, so a shared uh, genetic endowment that makes it possible for humans to acquire language, but also limits possible uh, synchronic languages that can be acquired and possible diachronic development. So, so, so in a way, it is sort of makes uniformitarianism a little bit more restricted. Uh, and this is sometimes called syntax or core computational component, as in this quote by Mark Hale here, uh, who says the computational component of the syntactic module of human grammar is universal and invariant. Uh, variation is limited to the lexicon, and what has traditionally been considered syntactic change is to be taken instead as representing a change in lexical features, in particular those lexical features that are of syntactic relevance. Uh, so he talks about syntactic change, but all of this is also applicable to the kind of morphological changes that uh, we're going to look at for uh, specific reasons. Uh, so this is known as the Borel-Chomsky conjecture. Uh, all parameters of variation are attributable to the features of particular items uh, or functional heads in the lexicon. Uh, and then Hale says, if we can reconstruct the morphosyntactic features of lexical items and functional heads, and we assume the syntactic compu computational system is universal and invariant, we can reconstruct output sentences uh, for a proto-language. And again, this is relevant for us because we're going to assume a non-lexicalist position, at least for the purposes of this talk, where word formation is not distinct from syntax, from phrase formation. Um, you don't have to do this outside of this talk. I just decided a while ago that there are good arguments against lexicalist approaches, um, so we're going to use this non-lexicalist approach. Um, and this is what it looks like. Uh, so in this approach, we're going to treat derivational or stem-forming morphology as functional heads or syntactic terminals, uh, which uh, have particular morphosyntactic features. So this is a simple example from end 2015, the structure for the English word cats after insertion. So we have a core, uh, a root with the core lexical meaning, uh, a categorizing head, and this is, these are the functional heads that we're interested in. So a categorizer that says this is a noun uh, that can have particular features. Um, and that has a particular realization, in this case it's zero because English doesn't do much in terms of um, nominal stem formation. Uh, and then a separate head that tells us that it's uh, plural. So corresponding to derivational and inflectional morphology more or less in the traditional terminology. Uh, so these heads and their features are stored in the mental lexicon of speakers and they vary from language to language, which isn't shocking because we know that the plural in English looks different from the nominal plural in Swahili or Old High German. Um, but this is essentially the borea chomsky conjecture. If there is variation, it's in these, in these functional heads, and of course also in these, in these roots. Um, so we're going to use this, we're going to treat a verbal stem forming morphology exactly the same way. So parallel to little n, we're going to have a little v here. Um, and this little v can have uh, different features, um, different morphosyntactic features or values. Um, it can be causative or uh, inchoative or express a state or an activity. There are different ways of formalizing this. Uh, this is basically terminology um, following uh, work by Heidi Harley and others. Um, and these categorizers select lexical roots or other categorizers with particular features that have to be compatible. And again, this is, this is just formalizing empirical observations because we know, okay, not every verb can behave as a causative alternation verb, right? Not every English uh, verb can undergo the causative alternation. And not every verb acts as an unaccusative or expresses a state. So this is just a formalization of uh, these observations uh, and the selectional properties and features of these categorizers can change over time. Um, and this is relevant for us. This uh, uh, happens through reanalysis, uh, defined here uh, as uh, a surface string in a particular grammar G2 receives a different underlying interpretation. Um, a representation than in the input grammar G1 during language acquisition, 
Uh, this is an acquisition-based approach to reanalysis. Um, for our purposes, it's just important that this is not structural simplification because we're going to see cases where we don't actually lose structure. We gain structure or we just have the same amount of functional heads. Um, so that's why I like uh, George Walkton's definition of reanalysis or description of reanalysis as um, a process whereby the hearer assigns the parse to the input that does not match the structure assigned by the speaker. Um, so uh, reanalysis is a mechanism uh, and it's not causal. So uh, it doesn't cause syntactic change, it is syntactic change. Um, it's a very nice way of putting this. And the same holds for morphological change because we've just uh, <coughs> said we're going to have a non-lexicalist position. Right, so these, these observations also apply to morphological reanalysis in our approach. Okay, um, and I think that's all we need to turn to our first case study. Uh, that's uh, Polino European NP. And fortunately, Hannes already talked about this yesterday, so um, I can go over this fairly quickly and go to the analysis. Um, but just as a reminder, this is, uh, this is the suffix in Proto-Indo-European that looks like a synchronic active participle suffix in most of the older Indo-European languages. Um, and in this, la so in the Iranian, Greek, Italic, Germanic, Tocharian, and so on. Uh, and in these languages, um, what's important is um, whether or not you have a formally active finite paradigm. If you have a formally active finite paradigm, you can make an active and participle. Uh, so valency isn't important, right? We saw a transitive, uh, an ergative, and an unaccusative. Um, valency isn't important. What matters is the presence of a finite active paradigm. Um, and oh yeah, here are also examples uh, to show you that this is really syntactically active. So we have participles with accusative internal arguments and um, subject agreement uh, and, and so on. Um, so this is usually described as subject oriented. And then we already saw that Hittite misbehaves. So Hittite, uh, the Hittite and participle uh, forms adjectival passives or looks like an adjectival passive. Uh, it does not care about voice morphology, so it can be formed to morphologically active or non-active finite verbs, but it does care about valency. Uh, so here we have some and participles to formally active verbs, and here we have some and participles to formally non-active or middle verbs, um, and they are. Uh, they behave syntactically the same way, so they look like passive participles. Um, but so theme oriented is maybe a little uh, more accurate. So, it, so what's important is that you have an internal argument or theme, right? And if this were an inner Indo European language, this would mean ceasing, giving, and going, and not ceased, given, and gone. Um, so theme orientedness instead of subject orientedness. Um, yeah, and this can also, so this really behaves synchronically like a passive participle. It occurs in periphrastic passives with demoted agents. Um, and uh, yeah, it's generally described either as passive or as theme oriented participle. Okay, so the problem that we already saw yesterday is that the Hittite reflexes of NT are passive um, or um, maybe more accurately, accurately described as theme oriented uh, or uh, expressing uh, some state. Uh, and this, the same thing is syntactically active in, uh, in Tocharian and Indo Iranian and Greek and so on. Uh, so, this tree again shows you the, the uh, function of NT correlated with the commonly assumed split of dates. Um, so here the Karen still looks like the, uh, the second to branch off. Uh, so this should probably be uh, a little lower in the tree. But the important thing is that everything after Anatolian uh, has something that looks like active NT. Um, right. Um, so, so the question is what, what should we reconstruct and, and this actually leads us back to Eugen's question from yesterday. So how do we know uh, which one is older? 
uh, should we reconstruct active? Well, that makes it very difficult to get the Anatolian youth from that, right? So it's, it's difficult to imagine. Can I go back here? Yeah. Um, so if we have active, so input structures like this, it's difficult to imagine how that could be reanalyzed as passives, right? So going from active to passive is going to be very difficult, even if you take an un, uh, unaccusative one like go, right? It's difficult to see how that's going to be reanalyzed as gone. Um, so, so this is uh, relatively difficult. We could start with the theme-oriented uh, situation in Anatolian, but then we have to explain how this changed into the you know, in the European active participle. Um, uh, and then the solution is uh, going to be what actually looks like a complication, the evidence for denominal NT in the in the European branches that we've already seen yesterday. So again, some examples. Uh, we've seen that this NT also derives uh, adjectives from nouns. Uh, we have nice examples from Hittite and uh, from uh, Indo-Iranian. Uh, some of these look very old, so probably inherited from Proto-Indo-European. Uh, and even some synchronic ones in Sanskrit uh, that look like participles, so Sahand and Shuchan but they can't be synchronic participles because there's no synchronic finite stem, uh, finite verbal stem. Um, or in this case, this is even worse. If there is one, then it's non-active. Uh, and we see the same in uh, some other Indo-European languages where we have these mismatches where things that look like active participles don't have a synchronic finite paradigm, or if they do, it's not an active one, right? So this looks like it should go with an active gero, uh, but there's no such thing, or, or a creo. Um, these don't uh, exist, and even worse, this one looks like an active participle, uh, but the corresponding finite verb is always non-active. This is a deponent verb. Um, so these have long been interpreted as archaisms, um, and, uh, and it's been suspected that this Participle NT um, was actually originally a denominal adjective. Uh, there are also typological parallels for this kind of development. Um, so for our purposes, what this means is that this NT must have uh, acquired more verbal functional structure. It must have been able to select verbal functional heads at some point in the course of its development. Uh, and this means its selectional properties must, must have changed from selecting roots to selecting a particular type of V, so originally stative V, and then eventually also eventive V. And this is what we need to get to the inner in the European stage. Uh, so this, this is a first attempt at sort of formalizing this. Uh, so in Proto-Indo-European and Proto-Anatolian, we must have had this stage, so this thing uh, selects uh, nouns or roots, it must be able to select nouns because we've seen examples from Hittite where we see this nominal stem forming morphology. Um, and then uh, from the reanalysis, so these adjectives are going to express states, so to go from this kind of state to a verbal state should be a fairly trivial reanalysis, right? So we get to this stage and this initially would have had a morphosyntactic feature state or stative. Um, and then the question is, how do we get from this to the next stage? Um, well, states are ambiguous. There's uh, a lot of literature on that. It can be a resultant state or a target state or different kinds of states. Uh, and some of these are more amenable to being reanalyzed as eventive uh, and some uh, as uh, processual, which Hannes already talked about yesterday. Uh, and then we get to a situation where uh, we have even more verbal functional structure. And this thing here that we don't need to worry about too much is what gives us the subject orientedness. So now we select something that actually has uh, an, an external argument. Right, so this is the Anatolian stage where we only have the internal argument. And this is the inner the european stage where we select something that also has an agent. OK, so this is the. Uh, First case study, um, the, or this is an attempt at formalizing this analysis. The second one uh, is similar here. We also go from uh, a nominal state or a, yeah, a nominal morpheme to uh, a verbal morpheme. This is Proto-Indo-European 
uh, e-learns one. Um, and here uh, we have a similar puzzle we see in almost all branches of Indo-European, a verbal stem forming suffix that looks like a long e from e-learns one. Um, but the distribution is weird. Um, so it, uh, it makes uh, the nominal and the verbal present, uh, but also aorists. So it doesn't seem to know whether it's a present or an aorist stem. Um, we, and this is unusual for verbal stem forming morphology in Proto-Indo-European. So this is immediately, uh, yeah, this makes it immediately suspicious. Um, in Anatolian, for example, we have uh, presence with this long e from uh, adjectives. Um, so, marsha and false, marsha it become false. Uh, in Latin, we have uh, primary the verbal uh, e forms and uh, the adjectival ones, and in Germanic uh, the same way. So, these languages all have presence. Um, but then in Greek and Slavic and Baltic, it looks like this thing um, makes primary aorists. So in Greek, this is called the passive aorist, um, but it's usually in the oldest stage, it's not necessarily passive, but um, inchoative. Um, so the solution for this that uh, LIV proposes uh, is to reconstruct two different primary verbal suffixes for Proto-Indo-European. One that they call fientif, and this is this elerinsha one that gives aorists in the daughter languages, and one that they call esif, and that's the elerinsha of this suffix plus uh, another suffix. So this is a composite suffix actually, and that results in presence in uh, the daughter languages. Um, and to give you an example for the entry of this root uh, tails to become dry. Um, here you see they reconstruct the primary aorist, the primary present, and then a fiantive and an asif. And to be fair, they have some question marks here for some of these forms, um, but um, it still feels, it feels a little redundant to have fiantive and asif in addition to reconstructed primary aorist and present stems. Uh, and then the question is, why do we assume that branch specific things that look like branch specific developments uh, are actually inherited, right? And they also say that, well, maybe this is actually derived from that and so on. Um, so this, this doesn't feel like the uh, ideal solution. There are also phonological problems associated with some of the reflexes of these uh, suffixes. Um, so an alternative that's been proposed is that this long e actually originated as a nominal suffix. Um, we see many old A verbs associated with uh, so-called adjectival roots or state uh, roots expressing a state that belong to the so-called Kalan system, so primary adjectives like red or dry and so on. Uh, and it's been suggested that this verbal A was originally identical to the instrumental singular ending on abstract nouns, on adjectival abstracts. And we still see this in some analytic constructions in Vedic and Latin where we have things with a long A or a long E plus some auxiliary uh, that express a state or a change of state. So become hidden or become uh, hot or make hot or something like that. So you can also make factitives. Uh, so this suggests again that this thing that looks like a verbal suffix was originally the nominal or the adjectival. Um, and developed into a stative, inchoative, uh, verbal stem forming suffix. And we still see this stage in Greek actually, because as we said, the passive aorist is actually uh, not passive at the oldest stage. It's uh, intransitive, uh, inchoative. It's in complementary distribution with verbal stem forming morphology. So it looks like a uh, lexical aspect originally and not a uh, syntactic aspect. Um, and, uh, and it originally uh, did not express a uh, voice, a uh, voice distinction. So the passive use uh, developed later and also suggests that this suffix uh, changed uh, in the history of Greek and acquired more, more functional uh, categories. Uh, so again, this is my attempt to, to formalize this a little bit. We start with uh, a noun with uh, particular features um, this probably should be uh, a separate functional projection, but we have to formalize this instrumental feature somehow. Uh, this seems to have meant with or maybe possession. 
um, and it looks like these, these types of features, when they're reanalyzed as part of the verbal domain, um, express states. And that's not surprising because, uh, yeah, this thing with or possessing something also expresses a state. Um, so this feature was reanalyzed as part of the verbal domain. I'm conflating uh, little b and aspect here, uh, which I probably shouldn't do. Uh, but originally, this uh, must have become reanalyzed as uh, a feature of little v. And then if we do that, we can also say, OK, the Indo-European the languages then categorize this as perfective or imperfective, depending on exactly what this little v expressed. Right? So what kind of state it is. Or is it entry into a state, then you're going to get a perfective verb, uh, or just a plain state, and then it's going to be a, a present stem. Um, so not all of these stages are, are illustrated here, but we get basically go from a nominal suffix to a state of little b to an inchoative little b. This is what we see in Greek. And then an inventive little b. This is also what we see in Greek when we get the passive use. OK, um, and this actually has some nice consequences, because this means we can take this whole thing uh, and also this Vedic form up there and conflate them into one, uh, which we're going to skip now, because I'm out of time. Um, yeah, I also wanted to talk about verbal diminutives in German and in Germanic. This is the third case study that's, that's actually the most exciting one, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll just show you. Uh, maybe the last slide, uh, where uh, so uh, diminutive verbs in German are very productive. Uh, they are formed with this L suffix that seems to be the same that we have in nominal diminutives. Uh, so the idea is here that we originally form a nominal diminutive with this suffix uh, and uh, verbalize it with a verbal category changing um, uh, head, and then this feature becomes reanalyzed as part of the verbal domain. And uh, interestingly, diminutive in the verbal domain seems to mean iterativity. So these things are uh, plurectional uh, iterative activity verbs. Um, okay, so to conclude very quickly, so these these case studies. What's interesting here is that we see. Uh, regularities in the in the way verbal derivational morphology develops. Surprisingly, often we start out with something nominal that becomes reanalyzed in the verbal uh, domain. Uh, we go from selecting uh, nominal heads to selecting verbal heads. Um, we very often go from stative to eventive, so adjective state, verbal state, uh, event. Uh, and there are good typological parallels for all these developments, especially the development of adjectival morphology to participial morphology, as Hannes already mentioned, has a lot of parallels. Um, and I think when we start to generalize and formalize the, the morphosyntactic features of these formations, we can identify, we can better identify regularities, right? So we see all oh, possessive means state when it's reanalyzed into the verbal domain uh, and so on. Uh, and this works even for developments that do not display traditional grammaticalization characteristics. So most of these things, um, I think, would probably not be analyzed as grammaticalization, right? It's, you don't go from uh, less grammatical to more grammatical or from lexical category to functional category. That doesn't seem to be happening. Um, but there's still a real analysis going on. And I think we can, yeah, we can find out more interesting things about that. Thank you.